And Glenn, of course, we always start with whoever was in the courtroom, and that's you. So how hot was that hot bench? Because when I was listening, we just had the audio. I felt I could hear the judges coming out of their chairs and leaning forward and trying to wrestle uh, the Trump lawyer into actually working with at least one of their hypotheticals. Yeah, Lawrence, I fought the urge to sort of loosen my tie, unbutton my <sighs> collar and yell out to uh, John Sauer, Donald Trump's lawyer, for gosh sakes, man, just answer the hypothetical. You know, uh, I may not have been in as many appellate arguments as my friend Neil, but I've argued before that bench and other appellate courts. And, you know, when judges present a hypothetical, they expect an answer, even if it's an answer that is perhaps unduly favorable to your client's position. But, you know, uh, John Sauer steadfastly refused to answer Judge Millett's hypotheticals, and she let him know that she was really displeased about it, and I don't think it served his client well. What he kept doing, Lawrence, was just saying the following phrase as if it were a magical incantation. He said, everything Donald Trump does and says and posts is core political speech. Therefore, there can be no prior restraint. There can be no gag order limiting his core political speech. And, you know, both Judge Millett and Judge Garcia very pointedly said there is a clear pattern that has been established. Donald Trump issues statements, including about witnesses, and witnesses get threatened. So they were having none of this sort of absolute argument that Donald Trump's lawyer was making. And uh, even though as the argument progressed for, as you say, two hours and 20 minutes, they also had some very pointed questions of uh, the, the prosecutor on Jack Smith's team. But it, it seems pretty clear that they're going to be inclined to perhaps narrow the gag order somewhat, hand it back to the trial court judge, Judge Tanya Chutkin, and, uh, and perhaps instruct her to, you know, impose something that is a little bit more narrow than what she imposed in the first instance. Uh, Neil, with all your practice in front of that appeals court, I'm just wondering what you were thinking at minute 21, minute 22, when we were still on the first judge's questions. <laughs> no other judges had even, got, even gotten to speak at that point. So first of all, Lawrence, this is our nation's second highest court, the D.C. Mm -hmm. Circuit. They're reviewing a judgment by Judge Tanya Chutkin, a very, very well-respected judge in D.C. Yes, the argument was set for 20 minutes per side, as you started mm -hmm. saying at the beginning of the show. But it is not uncommon for this court and Judge Millett in particular to go. I, last time I argued before her was three hours long. And oh, she is okay. she is an extraordinary the, the whole panel. This is an extraordinary yeah. group of judges. They're really dug in on every case, not just this case. And it's actually a real privilege that the American or it's actually I think the American public's right to hear this argument. Mm -hmm. And so it was great that we could all hear it live. What did I think at minute 20? It's the same thing I thought at minute two, which is, hey, Mr. Trump's lawyer, answer the question. Yeah. Answer the question. She spent 20 minutes trying to get an answer to the most simple questions. He couldn't answer them. So, I mean, Trump's lawyer basically took this kind of, you know, go home or go big approach. And I think he's going home, basically, mm -hmm. at the end of this, mm -hmm. um, you know. I do think that the government got some hard questions, Jack Smith's team, uh, toward the end. Um, they weren't questions really that Donald Trump's lawyer had focused on, but ones that they in their own research did. And in particular, I think they were concerned, did Judge, Judge Chutkin's gag order basically reach too far? Did it, basi did it say, for example, Donald Trump can't criticize the prosecutor, Jack Smith, in a presidential debate or something like that, that the panel was saying the First Amendment protects. So I think we may expect some modest trimming of the gag order. But at the end of the day, it sure sounded to me like the gag order will be upheld and history will be made for the first time. A former president will be gagged by the nation's second highest court. And the person to blame for that is none other than a guy named Donald Trump, who keeps opening his 
mouth, threatening witnesses, threatening the prosecutors, threatening others involved with this, and ultimately undermining a fair trial. And, and of course, Andrew, we had no set of precedents really to present to this court today. That's why they kept asking these hypotheticals is because they have to carve out something here that isn't sitting there ready to go uh, as, as a doctrine to use in, in this case. And, uh, and you just had the feeling that the, that the, the Trump lawyer was, was just never going to admit a thing for what? So that, so that the next stage, appealing to the Supreme Court, he hasn't conceded anything? What is that about? Yeah, so that's one of the reasons to do it, um, is if you think you're going to lose in this proceeding, essentially Stonewall here, uh, so that you know, there's no concession that can be latched onto. Um, but to give you an example of what Neil's talking about in terms of the question that the court had that was really legitimate was to say, look, it's a given that every defendant when they're released is told, do not commit a crime. That includes do not threaten a witness. That's, that's not a gag order. That's, yeah. that's just you can't commit a crime while out on bail. And so their question to him was, well, what else can the judge do? Does the judge have to wait until the crime is committed? Or is there any prophylactic step that she can take given this record? And as Neil said, this was repeated conduct where he knew he did a, a call, there was a response, call, response, over and over again. And he would not answer that question. And, you know, there's a, there's a reason is that, you know, he would be conceding ground to say, yes, the First Amendment does take um, sort of a second place to that balancing that should occur. Um, and that's where the, the court is clearly going to say that the judge is entitled to do some prophylactic step to make sure someone doesn't get hurt. Um, the main issue is going to be sort of just, you know, do they think it's as far as Judge Shutkin went or is it curtailed somewhat to cover witnesses and jurors, but maybe less protection for Jack Smith and his staff or the court and its staff? So I think Andrew just right. got it exactly right. The key question, and you showed it in your interchange with uh, Judge Garcia, the youngest judge on this panel, mm -hmm. is he said, look, do you have to wait? Does a judge have to wait until someone gets killed or mm -hmm. hurt? in order for a gag order to exist. And he asked that question multiple different ways mm -hmm. to the Trump lawyer. Trump lawyer never answered it. So that's where I expect the decision to come down, what Andrew's saying, which is absolutely a judge doesn't have to wait until harm occurs. Now the question is, what are the contours of that gag order? Glenn, I always wonder uh, during these uh, appeal sessions like this, what trial practitioners like yourself are, are thinking. I, I know you've done both, but the the trial side of, of your brain, do, do you, were you feeling like some of these questions, some of the judges' questions don't really grasp the reality of what we're dealing with? Oh, I think the judges' questions grasp the reality. And, you know, you always want to be responsive and respectful to a judge without giving up any ground that you don't have to give up. Um, but, you know, I thought there was one observation, I think it was by Judge Millett, when, you know, she was pushing back on Trump's lawyer, Trump's lawyer was taking the position that you really can't limit his speech. And the only limitation is he's not permitted to uh, issue a true threat. In other words, actually commit a crime that would violate 1512, you know, threatening witnesses. And that is the only limitation. And the judge kept pushing back. And Judge Millett said, you know, don't we have a settled principle in the law that someone uh, is inferred to um, intend the natural and probable consequences of their actions. And I think what she was getting at is that, you know, it doesn't have to be a true threat. For example, on January 6th, when Donald Trump simply said, Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what he should have done, that was not a true threat. But boy, he sure seemed to know what he was saying, and he it intended the exact consequences that ensued. His foot soldiers, his supporters, who were sort of mid-attack on the Capitol, you know, instantly started hunting for Mike Pence and began their chance. Hang Mike Pence. So really, true threats is not the standard. And the judges acknowledge this sort of call and response. And Donald Trump knows full well what he's doing when he makes the call. 
and he intends the response. Glenn, uh, before you go, I have to tell you, I was I, I'm fully satisfied with just having the audio of this proceeding today. And I actually think in my case, I might have concentrated more because I had absolutely no uh, image distraction in any way. But what did I miss by not actually being in the courtroom sitting beside you? Well, Lawrence, first of all, you had the benefit of hearing the volume of Judge Millett's voice. Yeah. And I, I think you would have uh, appreciated her demeanor, serious as a heart attack. She wanted an answer. And the fact that she didn't get one, I don't think that was Donald Trump's lawyer serving him well. But all three judges were very animated and very determined to make sure they got this right. If they're going to support a gag order on a former president of the United States, they want to make sure they get it right. And it was really a pleasure to watch those three judges question not only Donald Trump's lawyer, but the lawyer for Jack Smith's team as well. I don't know exactly what's going to be on my Thanksgiving plate this week, but I do know it won't be better than this. That was one of the many wonderful Thanksgiving dinners I've had on the road in Africa as we delivered desks to school in Malawi, where the kids have never seen desks. I've spent many, many happy Thanksgiving weeks and Thanksgiving days in Malawi. But this year, my Malawi tr trip was in October. It was my first time back in Malawi since the COVID pandemic began. On the first day of the trip, I met with a group of girls who are now in college thanks entirely to your generous contributions to the KIND Fund. Kids in Need of Desks is a partnership we created with MSNBC and UNICEF to provide desks to schools in Malawi and to provide scholarships for girls to attend high school in Malawi where public high school is not free and the boys' graduation rate is double the high school graduation rate for girls. Here are some of the college students who I met with on that first day in Malawi. Some of you might recognize Joyce Chazali standing right there beside me. She first appeared on this program in an interview that we recorded in Malawi when she was told, she told us the story of being sent home from her high school when her family could not afford her tuition fees. The kind fund came to her rescue and she went on to finish high school and pursue her dream of becoming a doctor at the College of Medicine in Malawi, where the COVID pandemic changed her focus to medical laboratory sciences. Did COVID make you think more about staying in medical science? Yeah, it really did. Because I could see like a lot of people dying. I could see a lot of people without knowledge of what COVID is. So being in medical school, it helps me to understand like how the COVID was like operating. I, could, I now like, and also being in a medical laboratory science whereby a lot of people are, do, are studying the viruses and they go to explain to us how the, COVID, how the COVID was mutating, how it is affecting people. I got to understand it better and I could explain to my parents and my friends at home how the COVID is doing, how they can prevent it and how they can go about it. So it is really helping and I'm so glad that I'm in this field. During a cholera outbreak in Malawi this year, Joyce was able to keep her family safe. During the whole Korea period, like none of my family members, even at the village, they were not affected by Korea because I knew the thing and I could be able to, to try to guide them. No, I couldn't reach out to everybody in the community, but at least I could help my family because, yeah, I know the things and they also got to know the things. Joyce hasn't finished her medical training yet, but she has probably already saved lives during the COVID pandemic and the deadly cholera outbreak in Malawi this year. And she was able to do that thanks to your generous support when she needed it most to finish high school. Yeah, I would like to thank the Kind Fun Scholarship and you and everybody in the team that is working towards this because without this, I couldn't, I couldn't have been here. I've been really helped a lot and I don't take it for granted. It's really an honor, a privilege that I had 
and I'm so thankful and glad for everything that you're doing and continue doing it because like you're supporting a lot of girls that they're giving hope to those who are not who are hopeless yeah and those who did not have dreams because they were like stuck somewhere you could be you were like what you're doing is like picking them up and then they will start dreaming because they know that I can do all things because there's somebody supporting me and I don't have to let those people down. So yeah, thank you so much. You can help girls like Joyce Chazali pursue their dreams by going to lastworddesks.msnbc.com where you can contribute any amount. Five dollars would be helpful, really anything. You can specify that it is for girls' scholarships or for desks. And you can make your contribution in the name of anyone on your holiday gift list, and UNICEF will send them an acknowledgement of your gift. Whenever Joyce or any of the other students in Malawi thank me, I always tell them that it is really an audience of millions of people who have been supporting them. It's really the audience that does this. I'm just the lucky one who gets to have the fun uh, hanging around with you. Yeah, I also would like to extend my gratitude to the audience that help because they are really doing a good job out there. So wherever you are watching this, I would like to say thank you so much for the support that you're lending and continue because it is not only me that is being helped, it is like a lot of girls out there that are being helped, even also those primary school kids that are in need of desks. They are also like you're bringing joy to their faces by donating so that they can have desks. So thank you so much.